Okay, I just wanted to kind of look at the timeline. So we didn't quite finish up 3.1 the last class. We had two, there were two word problems that I wanted to cover. Um, so I wrote them down and, and you don't have to write them down. Um, just kind of pay attention. And then after class, I will um, post everything because they're they're really wordy. <laughs> and I don't think I'm going to have time to sit there and wait until everybody copies down the whole paragraphs, okay? But they should be somewhat similar to the problems that you'll see in your uh, My Math Lab homework component, okay? Um, today we were on task to do 3.4. Now 3.4 is really long. So I'm, especially since I have to cover the two word problems from 3.1, um, we're definitely not going to finish 3.4 today. Um, but hopefully we can get through some of it, if not most of it. Um, I, I'm shooting for half. If we can get through half, then I can split 3.5 into two days as well. Okay. And so what it's looking like is that, um, and we're actually, yeah. So today we'll do 3.4. Next, on Thursday, the next time I see you guys, we'll finish up 3.4 and start 3.5. Um, but we won't finish 3.5 until we get to next week. Okay. Then what we'll do is we'll have a, a question and answer session over the review for the second test. Um, and then you will take the test online. So as soon as we have this Q&A session for the review, um, I will make the test available. And essentially you could take it anytime between um, Thursday the 27th and the following Monday, which is Halloween. Now, if you have plans on Halloween, I would definitely suggest doing it before then, right? Um, but it, you have a window from that Thursday when I open it until I think it's 11.59 p.m. that following Monday, okay? So there will be a big uh, window in there where you can take it. Now, you do need to download what is called a lockdown browser to take this test. Um, so I think you already did that sort of thing on. Um, the first test, so you shouldn't have to download anything extra. It should just be able to log into Canvas using that browser, um, and then you'll be able to start the test, okay? So again, it will be open on the 27th as soon as we finish the question and answer session, um, and then it'll be open until 11.59 uh, p.m. on Halloween, okay? Again, if you have plans on Halloween, please make sure you take the test before Halloween, okay? And if you have plans the whole weekend, then definitely make sure you take it either Thursday night or sometime on Friday, okay? Um, so we're pretty much on task. Uh, we're, we're not falling behind or anything like that. So hopefully we'll get through all of chapter four just in time before the Thanksgiving holiday and have that test before Thanksgiving. That way you can just enjoy your Thanksgiving. And then when we come back, we're just reviewing for the final and then taking the final exam, okay? So, so far we're on, we're on par with the original or the edited um, version of the timeline. So I'm gonna close that. I'm gonna go ahead and open up my video. So now you can see these problems that I have on from 3.1. Okay, so this is still 3.1. It's just the last two word problems that I wanted to cover. So the first word problem says, the table shows the percent of workers that stayed in their chosen field. The data are modeled by the following quadratic function, and they gave me that function there. And it says, predict the percent of workers that stay at their job in the year 2008. And it tells me that X equal to zero corresponds to 1990, and F of X is the percent, okay? So here you have your X's, and this isn't exactly my X's, right? If I wanted to have X, remember 1990 is X equal to zero, okay? So 1992 would be X equal to two, 1994 would be four, six, eight, and then for 2000, that would correspond to X equal to 10. Now, what they're asking me to do is figure out what's going on in 2008, okay? So that means I need to figure out what this X value is. So if 2000 is 10, then 2008 would be the X value of 18, okay? So I'm gonna write over here, 2008, 
I'm getting some kind of message. So let me deal with that. There we go. So 2008 corresponds to the X value of 18. And if they're asking for the percent and that's F of X, they're basically just asking me to find the Y value, right? Since we have our function here, all I need to do is just plug in 18 for X. So I'm taking that whole equation and I'm just plugging in 18 for X. So it's a lot of words, but really what they're asking me to do is not that complicated, okay? So I'm gonna use my calculator here. Um, let's see, clear all that out. So I have 0 0.1 parentheses 18 squared minus 1.1 18 by itself and then plus 35.83. And so I end up with this value 48.43. So that is the percentage, right? Because it said that the Y value, the F of X is our percent, right? F of X is the percent. So my Y value is the percent. So all they want in there is that 48.43, okay? So it wasn't too, too bad. It was just a matter of figuring out what X value corresponds to this year. And then once you know that X value, you just plug it into your function and you get the percentage, okay? If I know there's like two people that just logged in. So if you missed that first example, no worries, I'm gonna post it. And then you can watch the recording playback of it if you need to, okay? Um, but the next example, again, this is from 3.1, the last word problem from 3.1. It says the total amount spent by some number of people on clothing and footwear in the years 2000 to 2009 can be modeled by the quadratic function. And they gave me the quadratic function. It says where X equal to zero represents January 1st of 2000. X equal to one represents January 1 of 2001 and so on. And f of x, which is the y value, is in billions of dollars. According to the model, in what year during this period was the amount, time, the amount spent on clothing and footwear a maximum? So they're asking me for a maximum. And we did discuss in the last class that if you're talking about a parabola, um, it either opens upward, right? Or it opens downward. So if it's opening upward, you're talking about a minimum, but if it's opening downward, you're talking about a maximum, right? This is kind of recapping what we did the last class. And we also talked about how if your leading coefficient, the guy in front of x squared is positive, then it opens up like this. But if that coefficient were negative, it would be opening downward like this. Now look at my a. A is in front of x squared. My a value is negative. So it is opening downward and therefore it does actually have a maximum, okay? Um, and in order for me to find where that maximum is, I actually need to do the vertex, okay? And so the vertex formula, we can find the X value of the vertex formula by doing negative B over 2A. So this is my A, not the letter, just the number in front. And then this number in front is my B. So I'm gonna go ahead and calculate that. So I have negative of positive 72.78 over two times negative 4.773. And I'm not sure what that's gonna be, but we'll type it in here. So fraction negative 72.78 and then two negative 4.773. And we get this number. Now I'm not gonna round it just yet. It does keep going, but I don't know what those numbers are after the four because the calculator only gives me so much, okay? But I definitely have to figure out whether or not they're asking me for this X value or if they want me to plug that into the function and find the Y value, okay? So it said, in what year during this period was the amount spent on clothing a maximum? 
So they want to know what year. So remember, X represents the years that you're in, but F of X, which is the Y value, represents the billions of dollars. So if they're asking me what year, then they only need to know the X, okay? And since I got seven point something, that means I'm in that particular year. So if X equal to zero corresponds to 2000, then X equal to seven is going to correspond to 2007, okay? Now, I'm not at January 1st, obviously, right? Because I don't have just seven. I have seven point something or another. So that's like a little bit past halfway in the year. So even though I'm not at January 1st of 27, 2007, I'm still in 2007, okay? So it says in what year I'm in this year, 2007. Probably more like July, right, sometime, but still in the year 2007. Now, if the problem had asked me how much money did those people spend on clothing and footwear, then I might actually need to plug in the seven into the function to figure out that dollar amount, right? But it's not what they asked me. They just said, what year does this maximum happen at? So that kind of helped us with um, kind of revamping, you know, what's going on with the parabolas and stuff. But now we're gonna extend this knowledge, okay? So before we were talking about parabolas, which are only one kind of polynomial. X squared is definitely gonna be a polynomial, but you could also have X to the third power. You could have X to the fourth power, X to the fifth power, all sorts of exponents, okay? And those are all still considered polynomials. So we need to be able to start talking about our polynomial functions and what those look like in graphs and if they have maximums or minimums or anything like that. Now, I don't think we actually talk about maxes and mins, not until you get to calculus, which we're not going there. So, but we definitely can graph polynomials, okay? But there's a bunch of information that we have to learn about polynomials before you can actually like put everything all together, okay? So we definitely are gonna talk about those higher powers, maybe not just x squared, but x cubed, x to the fourth power, x to the fifth power, so on and so forth. Then we'll talk about the general graphs, right? Which are these guys here. We'll talk about this new word called zeros. We'll talk about turning points and what is called in behavior. Um, the graphing techniques also still apply to these kinds of functions, but we don't necessarily use them too much. So I might skip over this. We don't do a lot of the shifting and all of the, uh, the narrow and widening of the graphs like we did in the previous uh, section. I think it was like two point something. So we don't do too much of that. We do other things instead, okay? And then we're definitely not going to talk about the intermediate value theorem or boundedness theorem. Um, and we're probably not going to talk about approximations of real zeros. I'm not sure if there's any models in your um, assignment, but if there are, we'll talk about it. If there's, if they're not, we won't get to there today. But <laughs> if I do see some in your homework, then we'll definitely talk about those at the end. Okay. Models always just means word problems. Okay. But I didn't see, from what I remember, I didn't see any word problems in 3.4. But if there are some, then we'll talk about that. Um, but for now, we kind of got to get through, if I can get through these four concepts, maybe not even graphing everything just yet, but just getting through the information of those four concepts, then we're, we're, we're good, we're at a good spot to to continue in the next class because this section is very long, okay? So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is like the general graphs, okay? So we have a bunch of them here. These are all odd. Notice this says f of x equal to x. 
This one says f of x equal to x cubed. I'll zoom in a little bit. And then this other one is f of x equal to x to the fifth power, okay? Now, when we're looking at functions, you can tell a lot by looking at what's called the leading term, okay? So it's essentially the whole term that has the highest exponent in the whole polynomial. And if you just look at that one term, it tells you a lot of information, okay? It tells you like the maximum number of zeros that you could have. And I'll talk about that word zeros in a little bit. Um, zeros is a fancy way, a math way of saying um, x-intercepts, okay? So just looking at that one term, you can figure out what's the maximum number of x-intercepts that you could have. You could even, we'll talk about something called turning points. You'll learn about the maximum number of turning points that could happen. Turning points are usually like your, your humps and your valleys. Those are called turning points. Um, and you can even tell what the ends are going to look like called end behavior. So like where's the arrow going to go on the left and where's the arrow going to go on the right? Is it going to go up or is it going to go down? That sort of thing. Okay. So that leading term really does give us a lot of identifying information. Okay. So we're going to talk about some behavior. And then we'll kind of put it in a summary. So all of these functions are called odd functions, mostly because their exponent is odd, okay? So every single one of them, x to the one power, right? That's an invisible one power, one is odd. x to the third power, three is odd. x to the fifth power, five is odd. And I could keep going, but they just limited us to these three, okay? Um, for each of those three graphs, they all have odd degree, meaning highest exponent is odd, right? And they also exhibit what's called odd symmetry. Now, I know we skipped over symmetry, and we're really not going to talk about it, but for some reason, it's in this sentence, and so I'm just filling in the blank for you. Um, but it does have symmetry about the origin. Okay, and I briefly, briefly, quickly explained what that meant. And it just basically means if you fold your paper over any axis, I could fold it over the y axis and then fold it over the x axis, and this part would land right on top of that part. I could even fold it over the x axis first, right? And then fold it over the y axis, and it would still land on top of the other section. Okay, so it's just basically making two folds. One, I think when I was in elementary, they called it hot dog <laughs> folding and then hamburger folding. So you're folding in each direction and the graph lands on itself. That's essentially what the origin symmetry is. Not that we need to know that. We're not going to use that information, but it was in the sentence. Okay. If you look at all three of these, the arrows are going all the way to the left even though it looks like it's going down faster than it's going left, it is going left just a little bit. Little by little by little, it's making its way toward the left forever. And it goes to the right forever. It up, but to the right also forever. So that's why the domain for all of those odd functions is negative infinity to infinity. And the range is exactly the same. All of them have arrows going downward forever and then arrows going upward forever. So the range is also negative infinity to infinity. And if you notice, I could trace every single one of these graphs without picking up my pen or my pencil. So they are all continuous on the whole domain. And since the domain is negative infinity to infinity, they're continuous on negative infinity to infinity. Okay. Also, what we'll notice is that every single one of those three graphs increases the whole time. So starting from the left all the way to the right, it's just going up, 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 up. It has like a little wiggle in there, but it's still going up, up, up. Um, and so then this is the wording that they choose to use. They say that it falls to the left. So notice that the downward arrow is on the left side of each of these graphs and it rises to the right. So the arrows go up on the right-hand side for all three of them, okay? Now, 
If this coefficient in the front is positive, then yes, they do this. They fall on the left side and they rise on the right side. And this is also another way we draw in behavior. So I don't know what's going on in the middle. Notice that this middle part looks a lot different than this middle part, which also looks different than this middle part, okay? This one's like a little bit more flatter than that one. And that's definitely flatter than this, right? It's just straight. Um, so this is what's happening on the ends if your exponent is odd, okay? And if that number in front, that coefficient is a positive. So notice that here, my coefficient in front is a positive one, it's invisible. The number in front of x cubed is also a positive invisible one. And my number in front of x to the fifth is also a positive invisible one, which is why they all have this in behavior. They go down on the left or they fall on the left and they go up on the right or rise on the right. That's if the number in front were positive. We talked about in the transformation class that if the coefficient in front is negative, it basically flips the graph upside down. So then this part would go upward like that. And then the right-hand side would go downward like this. And so this is what the end behavior would look like if the coefficient were negative, okay? It would rise on the left and fall on the right. It'd be a little different, okay? We're also gonna examine what happens when we have even powers. Okay, like x squared or x to the fourth or x to the sixth. I mean, you can keep going, x to the eighth, whatever. All that's going to happen is it's going to look more flat than x to the sixth. And then x to the tenth will look even more flat than x to the eighth, and so on and so forth. So here, all three of these functions down here have even degree. So they have an even exponent. And even uh, functions actually have symmetry with about the y-axis. So if I were to fold the paper over the y-axis like this, just fold it like that, this graph would land on itself, okay? And doesn't matter which way I fold either, it's gonna land on itself, okay? And the same with the third one. So they all have that some symmetry. It's like the y-axis is the mirror and it looks the same, a mirror image of each other around that y-axis. Both of them still have the domain negative infinity to infinity because they do go to the left forever and then to the right forever, each one, okay? But the range is different. It's not negative infinity to infinity. Notice that the y values are, there's no y values down here. There's not even a graph, right? So the y values start at zero and then they go up. So that's why our range is from zero to positive infinity. And all even functions, no matter what, are also continuous, right? I can trace them and never have to pick up my pencil. But notice that they decrease on the left of zero and then they increase to the right of zero. All of them do that, okay? So they all decrease on this interval, but then they increase on this interval. And as long as my um, coefficient in front is a positive, then they will rise on both the left and the right. So as long as that coefficient is positive, it will go up to the left and to the right. They're parabolas and they're gonna open upward, okay? But if that coefficient in the front is negative, then it flips the parabola over. And so now both of the ends would be going downward, okay? So if that number in front were negative, then the parabola would be going downward. And so then the graph would be falling on both the left and the right. So there's a lot of information. It's gonna get summarized somewhere else later, but we're just kind of talking it out, okay? So the next page in the notes is this. And it, it kind of just kind of summarizes the um, transformations, but we already discussed transformations. You do not need to worry about transformations in this section. They're gonna have you do a whole bunch of other stuff, so don't worry about it. Um, so we're gonna skip that page. 
And on the next page, I am going to skip this example, but I did want to talk about this topic, okay, before we go and continue to the next idea. So it says, what happens to the range if the parabola y equals x to the fourth shifts up or down, okay? So we learned in the last class that if you do add a number outside of the um, basic function, that it actually moves it up or down, depending on if you're adding the number or if you're subtracting the number, okay? So for the plus two, it's actually going to make it move up, right? So this plus two shifts y equal x to the fourth up two units. So why is that important? Because if I were to draw y to the fourth, on the previous page, it just looks like a parabola at zero, zero. But if you're shifting it up to that point at zero, zero isn't at zero, zero anymore. Now it's here. And then you have your parabola. Okay, and so what happens to the range there? Well, the lowest y value of this parabola that I graphed would be the y value of two. And the highest y value, since it's going up forever, would be positive infinity. And so this would be my range if the function shifted up to. Now, what happens if I subtract a number outside the x to the fourth? Then that shifts the original down three units. So then in this case, instead of the parabola starting at zero and opening upward, it actually starts at negative three and then opens upward. So if I look at the range on that one, the lowest y value is negative three. And since it's going up on both ends, the highest y value would be positive infinity. And so then that becomes your range. So those shifts, the up and down shifts, they do affect your range. They won't affect your domain, right? Because it's still going left forever and right forever doesn't affect that at all, okay? Even if you were to slide it to the left or to the right, it would still have those arrows on both sides. So those shifts are not going to affect your domain ever. Even if I were to flip the parabola over, it's still gonna go to the left and to the right forever. So none of the transformations will affect your domain, but when you shift up or down, it does affect your range, okay? And that's the whole purpose of why we, decided to talk about it, just so that you're aware that that is happening, okay? So your range can get affected by the up and down shifting. Now, this is a really good um, thing to talk about. We've mentioned it in a previous video, but you know some of these things are gonna keep being repeated just to kind of drill them in, right? Um, but it says, Unless otherwise restricted, meaning either one, they tell me that I'm only looking at this particular interval of the graph, I'm not looking at the whole graph, just a restricted domain, or, and I think that's pretty much it, because with polynomial functions, there's no denominator to consider for domain, and there's no radicals to do consider for the domain. Polynomials do not have those, okay? So, Unless there's some little comment on the side that says only look at this interval, you're going to assume that it's just a regular polynomial domain and range, okay? And so the domain of all polynomials, no matter whether they're even powers, odd powers, a mix, it does not matter. All polynomial functions are going to have the domain negative infinity to infinity. Not only that, they're going to be continuous. And here's another calculus word, smooth. It's a whole thing, don't worry about it. <laughs> it's just, there's no like sharp 
it just basically when you draw it okay it's really just flows and it's curvy and all that good stuff that's layman's terms definition of smooth okay and continuous again a calculus word but we just describe it as you can draw it without picking up your pencil right there's no holes no gaps no breaks in the graph okay so all of these should just be smooth little curves that you draw you're just basically connecting all the dots okay um and they're going to be that way throughout the whole graph from negative infinity to infinity now if you're specifically talking about odd degree polynomials then those have a range of negative infinity to infinity right if we look back at those remember those go down and up forever so the range would be negative infinity to infinity however for polynomial functions with even degree um the range is going to be what letter do they use it's actually going to be negative infinity to k or it's going to be from k to positive infinity so if it's opening upward whatever that number is that you shifted by that's going to be the beginning right and then it goes upward to positive infinity which is this whereas if they were opening downward then the highest the lowest y value is negative infinity and the highest is just that k value okay um i'm trying to think so yeah this one is if it's opening downward right and then this one is if it's opening upward and why k because k is that shift that's happening so i'm going to write where k is the vertical shift so now we're going to get into what's called behaviors at zeros and i can't even talk about the behavior yet <laughs> until I talk about this word, right, zeros. So we've never used that word before. Normally when you say zero, you think of the number that looks like a circle, right? Um, that's zero. But we're not saying the number zero anymore. We're saying it's not the number. They're called zeros, but what they really are on the graph is x-intercepts. And how do you get x-intercepts? You always make the y value equal to zero, and then you solve, right? That's how you find your x-intercepts. So these words, zeros, is the same word used to describe x-intercepts, and it's also used to describe the solutions to your function equal to zero, okay? So if you see a value like x equal to some number, that number is a solution to this equation, that number is called the zero. That number is an x-intercept. And if I write it as x minus that number, that's actually a factor of your f of x. Meaning if I had a polynomial, I could factor the polynomial. Remember factoring from the very, very beginning? It's gonna come back. Um, I can factor my polynomial and this guy would be one of those factors, okay? which is kind of cool because if you're given a graph and you see all the x-intercepts, then you already know what all the factors are gonna look like, okay? But the way it touches the x-axis, the way that it hits the x-intercept gives you even more information about those factors, okay? So these are the three different ways that your graph can have an x-intercept, okay? So imagine these are all of the x-axis. If you wanted, you could imagine the y-axis over here somewhere, right? But these are all the x-axis, okay? And so in these two cases, it doesn't matter if you're coming from the bottom and going up or coming from the top and going down. Both of this type of behavior, you're actually crossing through this x-intercept C, okay? So for all of those, you cross 
through the x-axis, okay? And what that tells you is that the zero is a multiplicity of one, okay? That word multiplicity has two meanings. One is it means that's how many times that that answer is a solution, okay? So if this C appears once, then that means when I solve this equation, I only got X equal to C one time. So let's say that C value is five. My X intercept is at five. And I go and solve my function equal to zero. I'm gonna get X equal to five just once. I'll probably get some other answers, but they won't be five. They'll be something else. But the X equal to five only happens once. That's one way of saying multiplicity. The, the other way of saying multiplicity is if you have your function all in its little factored form, right? Here's one zero, I don't know what number that is. Here's another zero, I don't know what that number is. Here's another zero, again, I don't know what these numbers are. There could be however many, it just depends on how big your polynomial is. This would be a polynomial with x squared, right? If I have a third factor, that would be a polynomial with x cubed. If I had a fourth one, x to the fourth, and so on. However, you also have multiplicity of this first zero, multiplicity of the second zero, multiplicity of the third zero. So the multiplicity also tells you the exponent on that factor, okay? So if I see that I'm crossing through this number here, then I know that I'm gonna have X minus that number as a factor, but because it crosses, I also know that that exponent will just be a one. Now, another way that you can touch the X axis, right? Making an X intercept is if you do this, like you're coming from the top, but instead of going through it, you actually just bounce right off and go back up, okay? Or if you're coming from the bottom, instead of going through it, you just go right back downward, okay? In those cases, um, I don't say tangent, tangent is also a calculus word, I say bounces, okay? So it bounces off the x-axis. And when it bounces off the x-axis, it's going to have what's called an even multiplicity. For us, we usually just use two. So the multiplicity will be two. Here, the multiplicity is one, right? So if it bounces, it should have multiplicity of two. Think of like x squared, right? It has a power of two. Multiplicity is a power. And don't they do that, right? They do this motion at the x-intercept when you look at the graph of x squared. So I will have, that guy is my zero or my x-intercept. x minus that number would be my factor. And if it's bouncing off of it, then I would know the exponent on that factor. We will have examples, I promise. <laughs> it's a lot of information, but we'll get to the examples in a little bit, okay? The last, last, last scenario that you can have, it doesn't go exactly through it. Like in this case, it actually, it, this is the word they literally use, is it wiggles through it, okay? So it's not going straight through it. Notice how it kind of wiggles a little bit and then comes out the top. Here, same thing, I'm going downward and then it's like a little wiggle and then it goes in the other direction. What's the difference? another calculus word, it has to do with concavity. This side looks like a downward parabola, but this side looks like an upward parabola. So that's what's causing that little wiggle to change the little flow of how the graph is moving, okay? When it wiggles there, you have an odd multiplicity greater than one. So normally what we use is m equal to three. So when it wiggles, your multiplicity will be three. That means if you were to set the function equal to zero and get your answer, let's say that's a five, and get the answer five, you actually got x equal to five three different times when you had solved the problem, okay? And why? Because there's three of the same equations, which means you have three of the same factors. 
which is the exponent is three. So knowing how it's touching the x-axis not only tells you what the, what the factor is, but it also tells you what the exponent on that factor is. So that definitely helps. So if they give you a graph, you can kind of guess like what the function is gonna look like, okay? And that will be some problems that we'll have to do. Now, another topic that we wanna talk about, cause there's, I got 30 minutes, there's two more things we need to talk about before we get into some examples. One of those things is what's called turning points. So when you draw a parabola, let me get all these papers out of the way. When you draw a parabola or a polynomial, it's gonna essentially do this, something like that. I don't know how many wiggles, I don't know how high up or how low these little things are gonna go. I just drew a random polynomial, okay? All polynomials are gonna look like these smooth, continuous curves with all these little waves, okay? The number of waves and where the x-intercepts happen and all of that depends on the function, okay? But when we ask you about turning points, this is a turning point, this is a turning point, this one is, and this one is. So it's all the peaks and the valleys of the function. So how many times does it change direction essentially, okay? So if you have a polynomial with degree n, meaning your function looks like this, you have a x to the n, and then everybody else has a smaller exponent than that first term, okay? n is the degree, n is the highest exponent. You're going to have one less maximum number of turning points, okay? So what does that mean? That means if I have a function, I'm just making stuff up, okay? If I have a function that looks like this, my degree is the highest exponent. My highest exponent here is three, which means I will have a maximum of two turning points. That does not mean that I will have two turning points. It means I won't have any more than two turning points. So if you draw it and you're wiggling all about and you're like, hey, wait a minute, I have like too many curves it's way more than two changes, um, my graph is not right, okay? Um, you could have those two turning points. You could also just have one turning point or somehow you could have no turning points at all, okay? It just depends on other pieces of information, okay? But I just wanted to make you aware, it's a maximum of one less than the degree, okay? So if you're looking at it and you're trying to connect all your dots and you're gonna have to do a lot of wiggles in order to connect all your dots, but it's too many wiggles, you'll know something's wrong, okay? It's kind of just like a, a little safekeeping tip so that when you're done connecting all your dots, you know, it kind of confirms that, you're get, that your graph is correct. But I know there's like a, some problems in the assignment that literally just ask you how many turning points does it have, okay? So we definitely need to talk about it. So if I were looking at this thing that I just randomly draw, notice that it has one, two, three, four turning points. This graph would have to be x to the fifth or higher. It would have to be an x to the fifth, an x to the sixth, an x to the seventh, something higher, okay? But it definitely would have to be x to the fifth for sure nothing lower than x to the fifth for that particular graph. Okay, now this box I really don't like. So I'm basically gonna create my own box over here in a minute. Um, this is like the math way that they say it, but it, it, it's complicated. I don't like the way they word it, okay? Um, it says basically if your coefficient, right, if the number in the front is positive, then when x goes to infinity, meaning when x goes to the right, your y value goes to positive infinity, meaning your y value goes up. 
So as X goes to the right, Y goes up. That means this. As X goes to the right, the Y goes up. As X goes to negative infinity, that means I'm going to the left. Y is going down. So that's this. Now, if the number, the coefficient in front is a negative, less than zero, then when X goes to positive infinity, when X goes to the right, Y goes to negative infinity, which means it goes down. So as I'm going to the right, it's going down. And then as X goes to negative infinity to the left, the Y is going to positive infinity, which means it's doing this. So I like these symbols better than these little words. I don't, I don't like that at all. I just use the arrows. Okay. And how do you say this in words on, on the my math lab? This would be falls to the left, rises to the right. For this scenario, it would be rises to the left and falls to the right. And this one's even weirder when you try to explain it. So here, my number in front is positive, okay? And it doesn't matter whether X is going to positive infinity or whether it's going to negative infinity. On both the left and the right, the Y value goes to positive infinity, which means on the left and on the right, it's going upward. And again, there's that little symbol, right? Same thing here. It doesn't matter whether X is going to the positive to the left, left or negative to the right, if that number in the front is negative, it's going to go downward, right? The parabola is going to go downward. So then you're going to have downward motions on both sides. Okay. So once you identify your leading term, it's the one term in the whole polynomial that has the highest exponent. Once you eyeball that one, you're just looking to see if the number in front is positive or negative right? And whether the exponent of that guy is odd or even. That will automatically tell you what kind of in behavior you have. So when you go to try to connect the dots, you know where to start on the left-hand side, and you know where you should be ending up on the right-hand side. What you have to do in the middle depends on the zeros, the x-intercepts, and all kinds of other stuff, okay? The turning points and all of that. So here we have our first like real example, right? And this is just picking the graph without ever having to graph it, okay? Just looking at the end behavior, you can already figure out which one goes with which one, okay? So I'm gonna match them. I'll write A, B, C, or D next to each one, depending on which one it is. But if I'm looking at F, I need to pinpoint the term that has the highest exponent. That happens to be this one, okay? And if you notice, the coefficient in front is a one, right? One x to the fourth. Well, in this case, a is positive and n, which is the exponent, is even. That means that I am looking at a case of a positive a x to the even. And if I'm looking at positive a x to the even, then it should have this in behavior. It should be going up on both ends. There's only one graph that does that on both ends, and it is c. This one here is the only one that goes up on both of the ends. So this one is f of x. Let me try to use some different colors here. So for the next one, I'm gonna go this way for g. If I eyeball the term with the highest exponent, it's this term there. And if you notice in that term, it's like a negative invisible one X to the sixth, right? Now, my A is negative one, which is less than zero, right? It's negative. 
and my n, my exponent, is 6. 6 is even. So my n is even. So now I'm looking at when a is negative and n is even. That is a negative a x to the even situation, which says it should be going downward on both ends. There's only one graph of the four that goes down on both sides, and that's this one here. So this one's got to be g of x. So then for my next one, h, I'm only looking at the guy with the highest exponent, which is this one. Here, a is positive, and the n is 3, which is odd. So you're talking about a positive a x to the odd. Positive a x to the odd is up here, and it looks like that. It goes downward and then upward. There's only one graph that goes down on the left and then goes up on the right. And that's this one here. It goes down on the left and then up on the right. So this one is h of x. And then the last one, if we look at the term with the highest exponent, that's this guy. It's a negative invisible one, x to the seventh where that coefficient is actually negative, but your exponent is odd. So that's a negative a x to the odd. So that's gonna go the other way. It's gonna go this way, right? That's the way it looks right here. So it should go up on the left and down on the right, which means this guy is k of x. So just by looking at the end behavior, you can tell. That's gonna come in handy on the final exam because the final exam is multiple choice. And so when they give you that, if you can outrule like, I mean, shoot, just the odds, right? If there's like four graphs and you can outrule two of them just because of the end behavior, you're down to a 50-50 shot of getting it right, just knowing end behavior, okay? It really does come in handy and we will use it a lot in this section. That's usually one of the first things that, that it asks. Okay, so now we have our graphing techniques. So there's not really a whole bunch that we'll do to graph these things. We'll find the x-intercepts or the zeros, right? Quote unquote zeros. And we'll even um, find the y-intercept just by plugging in zero for x, that'll give us the y-intercept. But we also need to do some more things. So we'll also use the end behavior. The multiplicity. Of the x-intercepts. And you may even need some extra points, right? Because if you know that it's supposed to have a turning point, it's gonna change direction. You might wanna know how high up that turning point goes, right? Um, so you also might need some selected points. So we're not going to actually do this particular problem. I'm going to change it. We're going to actually graph um, this one so that it looks more like something in your homework. So we'll graph this one. And then this will be the only example that we cover. We'll, there's, I mean, there's a whole bunch more to the chapter or this section, but we're just going to do this one, OK? So you might not be able to finish 3.4 yet, but um, 
after we come back on Thursday, then you should be able to finish a 3.4. So in order for me to, I could figure out what the end behavior is right now. And I could even figure out what the y-intercept is right now because you just plug in zero for x, okay? Those two things I can do right now. The things that I cannot do yet, which require me, right, is this one. I'm going to have to set the whole function equal to zero and solve. And when I do that, because it's a polynomial, I definitely want to factor the function, not only because it helps me get the solution, but also because it helps me figure out what the multiplicity is. Because that's going to tell me how my graph touches that x-intercept right? Whether it goes straight through it, whether it bounces off of it, or whether it wiggles through it, okay? I have to know those multiplicities. So we're definitely going to have to factor this function at some point, but for now, I'm going to do the two things that I can do, okay? And that's the end behavior and the y-intercept. So for step one, it's asking me for step one, but I'm not going to do that first. I'm going to actually find the y-intercept, because that's pretty easy. You just plug in f of zero. So the x will become zero. And when I do that, I end up with negative two. So what is my y-intercept? Negative or zero for x, because that's what I plugged in, and then negative two for the y-value, because that's the y-value I found, right? This is my y-intercept. So I'm going to need that. I'm going to box it because I'm going to use it when I graph this thing. Okay. The next thing that I can do is I can figure out the end behavior. In order to do that, I have to look at the highest exponent term. So the term with the highest exponent is this guy. So I'm looking at that guy. That's a positive A x to the odd. It's got an invisible positive one in front, and it's got an odd exponent. And according to the previous page, that's going to look like this. So now I know what the end behavior looks like as well. And these little things will be on the review sheet in the, in the review, or not in the review, but on the test. It'll have this little boxes. Okay, the two things that I can't do just yet without factoring are finding the x-intercepts and finding the multiplicity, okay? So in order for me to do that, I am going to have to factor f of x. And right now we're pretty basic with factoring, but we will learn more in the next, in this section on other ways to factor, okay? But right now, all we have is we can factor binomials using the formulas, we can factor trinomials using the AC method, and we can factor uh, four terms using the grouping method. Those are the only ways we know how to factor right now, okay? So when I do this, I do have four terms. So if I look at my function, I'm going to group this because I have four terms. Now, these two terms have x squared in common. And if I divide by that x squared, I will still be stuck with an x. Those will cancel, and I'll be stuck with a 2. So if I distribute this x, I should get those original two terms. Then if I bring down my minus sign, I have this. These two guys do not have anything in common. So the only thing I can factor out is a one. But because the minus sign came down, it's actually a ne negative one. So I would take this term and divide it by a negative one and this term and divide it by a negative one. What that does is it gives me positive x and positive two. And again, if you distribute the negative one, you should get those two terms. That's how you know you factored it out correctly. So then this half of the problem and that half of the problem, 
have this factor in common. And so when I factor it out, I'm just stuck with the x squared and the minus one. However, x squared minus one is a difference of squares. So it factors. One times one is one. So this becomes x plus one and then x minus one. And so this is my function completely factored, okay? And I need that because that's gonna help me with two things. It's gonna help me figure out the x-intercepts and it's gonna help me figure out how I touch those x-intercepts, okay? So I think I'm gonna move over to the next page and then we'll put this together. I'm gonna cross off step two and step three because we're just doing it. We're not doing certain steps in certain orders. Um, so now in order for me to figure out my x-intercepts, I have to set my function equal to zero. So I'm gonna find my x-intercepts. So we're gonna set f of x equal to zero. Well, f of x is equal to this, right? So it's this. that I have to equal to zero. And since it's already factored, I can use my zero factor property and say that that equals zero or this equals zero. Or this one equals zero. And if I solve for X in each of those equations, you would have to minus two, right? You get X equals negative two you get x equals negative one, and then you get x equal to positive one. Now, each one of these has a multiplicity, okay? So your x-intercepts are going to be negative two comma zero, x is negative two, and you set the y equal to zero, so the y is zero. Negative one zero and one zero. These are your x-intercepts, but they do come with multiplicities. Remember the multiplicities are the exponents of the factors. So if you look at this function here, what are the exponents on each of these factors? It doesn't appear to have any, but we know that when you don't have an exponent, it's an invisible one. So there's an invisible one on each one of these factors which means this guy has a multiplicity of one. This one also has to have a multiplicity of one. And the last one also has a multiplicity of one. So that means I'm actually gonna cross through this x-intercept. I'm gonna cross through that x-intercept and I'm gonna cross through the other x-intercept. So now we'll try to put all of this together and see if we need any extra points, okay? Because that's the last thing that you do is come up with extra points. So my y-intercept was zero, negative two. So my y-intercept is this dot right here. My x-intercepts are negative two, Um, negative one and positive one. So those are all of my x-intercepts. And I know my end behavior is gonna go downward and then upward on the end, okay? And what is the maximum number of turning points? It's my highest exponent minus one. If you look at the original, the highest exponent is three. So if I minus one, I will have a maximum of two turning points, okay? Now, the problem is, is that I don't know how high up the graph goes, because I know I'm gonna come this way and I gotta cross through it. But since I gotta cross through that one, I'm gonna have to come back down, which is gonna cause one turning point. But is it down here? Is it up there? We don't know, okay? So I will have to figure out a y value for a number in between there. 
like negative 1.5. Then once I go through this, I'll hit through there and come back up, but I don't know if I'm gonna go directly there or if I'm gonna go down and then up to there. I have no idea. So I also need another X value of negative 0 0.5. I'm gonna need another one in here at positive 0.5. And that should be enough to figure out what's going on, okay? So remember, these numbers go into the original function. So let me program my calculator. Negative 1.5 store is x, and then I'm gonna do x to the third plus two x squared minus x minus two, because that was my function, right? and I get this value. Now I'm gonna plug in negative 0 0.5. So copy and then plug it in. And then now I'm gonna plug in positive 0 0.5. And you can plug them in individually. You don't have to program the calculator. It just saves time to program the calculator. So these values are pretty small. So at negative 1.5 in the middle here between negative two and negative one, I'm at like just a tiny bit over a half. So about right there somewhere. Then at negative 0.5, I'm at negative 1.25. So about there. And then at positive 0.5, I'm almost at negative two actually. I'm a little bit further down, almost at negative two. So now we can see, Remember the in behavior. You have to go up through there, through there, and then through that one. And I have the correct in behavior as well. Now you can graph them when they're already factored for you because you just don't have to do all the factoring part, right? They do it all for you already. But we'll continue with that example in the next class, okay? So right now it was just a lot of information and we got to kind of see it together in one example, but to really hone in that information, we're gonna keep seeing more examples, okay? So when I see you again on Thursday, we'll continue and we'll just be going at more examples, okay? And then sometimes they give you ugly functions and you can't factor them by grouping, and you can't factor, and they're not already factored for you. So we'll learn eventually some other techniques on how to find those factors, okay? But we will be doing some more examples with this when we come back, okay? Um, if anybody has any questions for me, please ask. Um, if not, you guys are free to go, and I will post the recording and the notes as soon as we finish out through here. But you guys have a good day. You too. Thank you.